Now let's talk about Gerber daisies. Gerber daisy is the genus Gerbera jasmonii. My German is awful and I will not s attempt to say his name. But it's very commonly used as a cut flower across the country, across the world, and also it's growing in popularity as a potted color plant, as a bedding plant. We're talking about it here as a cut flower. It is a flat-faced, multi-petaled, uh, daisy-like flower. It's, it's like the chrysanthemum, two to five inches apart, and there are hundreds of colors. Now, the myth or le legend shows that this is, um, was named by um, Gerber in 1743. And it's very distinctive because of the uh, false petals um, create the symmetry and it's their texture that gives them the, the satiny sheen, which makes them a high quality. And because the true botanical flower itself is that fuzzy yellow center. Now the modern breeders are primarily in Holland and Germany. Um, it's got lots of different shades and lots of different colors. And they're used as a dynamic focal point in arrangements. Like with snapdragons, most of the cut flower Gerber production is done in California. This value hasn't changed. Um, We'll see some Gerber production when we tour greenhouses later this fall. And um, you can see that the California production, and these numbers are still pretty, pretty solid, except it's now probably about 35 cents a stem, California, and 50 to 55 cents a stem in the rest of the country. Where they're grown in volume, they get a, a smaller volume value. Where they're grown in smaller volume for a local market, we get a higher, higher value. So here we can see these, um, the petals on the outer side and the, the flowers are the center part of the flower arrangement itself. We have bedding plant varieties, we have potted plant varieties, and we have cut flowers. The cut flower varieties are primarily on very long, like a 28 inch scape. Now it's a scape in that it has the stem that we see that the flower is born on is has no branches. It's one stem, there are no nodes, there's no internodes. It's one elongated scape. Historically, um, most Gerbers came from seed or divisions. They divide well in the garden and places like that. But almost all the modern propagation that we're using now for cut flowers is from tissue culture to get clean materials. Now, most of the culture is either a raised bed culture or in the ground, or a hydroponic soilless culture or hydroponic troughs, which is probably, for cut flower production, the primary uh, production practice for uh, Gerbers. Troughs, NFT. NFT troughs, correct. So here we have Gerber production in the ground, um, in ground beds. We need a deeply tilled um, loamy soil. It needs to be sterilized either with methyl bromide or pasteurized with steam. Um, the raised beds, uh, we want them at least 12 to 24 inches above the ground so we're not kicking soil in them. They're very susceptible to um, diseases and typically on very narrow raised beds. Here we can see these raised beds, actually we only have two rows of plants in each bed. There are two and there's uh, two here and two here where you can't really see in the middle in between the pink ones, there is a, a walkway in there as well. Gerbers are susceptible to a lot of root zone diseases, so the way we plant Gerbers is in many ways different than we plant other plugs and hence my very talented graphic here. We're going to get them as a, as if we're getting a seedling or as a, tr a plug that's been grown from tissue culture, we want to 
plant the plug on the soil surface. We don't plant Gerber daisies deep in the soil. You're taught to plant everything at the same level. In this case, I want you to plant them high because I want to have the crown of the plant to not be in the soil because they're really susceptible to crown rot because these are a crown or a, um, have a crown uh, which will catch water. So I want to have the top portion of the ro roots zone out of the potting soil at that level. So it's important because I don't want the rosette of the blue, a rosette of the leaves, to gather water. We'll use uh, irrigation, overhead irrigation, for a little while. But after the crown or the rosette starts to form, I don't want to use overhead irrigation because I don't want to have water accumulating in that cup. So most people use drip irrigation. Um, we don't do a wet, dry cycle with uh, Gerber daisies. We need uniform moisture. They're not a heavy feeder. 130 parts per million uh, nitrogen, uh, 50 phos phosphate, and 190 potassium. A little high on the potassium side with this crop, whereas others are one, one to one. We need uh, micronutrients, primarily iron. They become iron uh, deficient with cold soils. And uh, we use a pH of 6 to 6.5. Growers will either acidify their water, and preferentially with this crop, most growers will acidify with nitric acid rather than sulfuric acid, even though it's a fuming acid. Most Gerber production in the United States, though, is grown in some kind of a hydroponic system. So here we have raised troughs where the Gerbers are actually, this particular grower uses suspended pots where the pots actually fit into aluminum trough and each one has its own basket emitter. Um, anything that holds water, um, we want to have a substrate 60 to 70 percent of its volume. So most people use rock wool or core. Core is coconut fiber. And um, Trough dimensions are typically the NFT troughs that we use for um, Gerber daisies is five inches by seven inches, which is a little bigger than what the lettuce growers use. And it's got to be sloped for a drainage. Most growers will put, this, put their NFT troughs in. They either do NFT with a basket stake and irrigate each individual plant, then recycle the water. Uh, irrigation demand is based upon how big the plants are, how warm it is, how hot it is, the evaporation rate. So for instance, summer production, they'll use 20 to 30 ounces per day, whereas winter production, they use half that much. And of course, during the summer months, we're going to leach it 17 ounces per plant. In the winter time, we're going to leach it at a lower rate. Which means that in the uh, winter months, we're going to use a slightly higher fertility or slightly higher fertilizer concentration because we're putting on a little less water and um, we want to make sure that they, they don't get um, uh, starved because Gerber daisies do not recover well from deficiencies. So in a hydroponics production scenario, for Gerber daisies, quite often they'll irrigate as many as six times per day, where the irrigation volume, they'll be irrigating for five minutes, seven, seven, nine, seven, so forth and so forth. But in the winter months, you can see where it's cut drastically down, where we're only irrigating five times per day. So this multiple irrigation treatment guarantees that the plants don't get excessively dry and they have a constant supply of water without getting waterlogged. We use two tank formulas uh, with uh, nitrogen and um, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium in one tank. And then the uh, tank B with the second injection system, we'll use, uh, put the micros in there 
so we don't conflict with um, phosphates and calcium because we're primarily using calcium nitrate and uh, phos uh, ammonium phosphate. Now, excess high root activity of snapdragons, they will lower the pH of her leachate water. And so, times in, so for pH and alkalinity control, even though it's lowering the pH, we can use a product like nitric acid and not sulfuric acid for our alkalinity control. And uh, 0.6 to 1 decisiemens per meter for electrical conductivity is fairly low, whereas tomato crops or rose crops or other uh, crops we've talked about before, electrical conductivity has, has been more than twice this. Again, the roots are very sensitive to um, salt burn. Temperature, night 54 to 57. You can inject um, in the winter months when, it's, um, when you have um, uh, low light They'll respond to some CO2 enrichment. Uh, primarily, we do our CO2 enrichment in the early morning. Late afternoon, it's a waste of money. Uh, it's a high light crop. It needs the brightest lights that you can get. And again, this is somewhat of a facultative long day plant. Here's some greenhouse production shots of um, Gerber daisies. This is a NFT trough where the plants are in a um, rock wool cube. They're just placed in the NFT trough with its own basket stake, and the water is collected and drained off. This particular shots are at a greenhouse. Uh, this is Dram and Ector in Encinitas, California. And here you can see the crop is much larger, ready to harvest the blooms. You can see how the scapes are formed. Algae problem can be a problem. These are more greenhouse production. Now we harvest uh, Gerber daisies when um, you can start harvesting eight to 12 weeks after planting. Some Gerber daisies will be in production for a, a year or more. We want to have at least two to three rows of the stamens are visible in the center of the flower. So that means it's what we call pollen shed or anthesis. And we harvest the Gerbers by pulling them straight up. We don't cut them. And then they'll trim them a little bit. And uh, oftentimes, they'll be wrapped with a little bit of flower netting to protect the bloom. What they'll do is, uh, as they're harvesting, and they actually have pegboards. And they drop them into pegboards where the, fo the flowers don't touch. And that's how they're carried into the pack house. And the pack house then slides a uh, flower net up on the stem for transport. And how do you get them off? No, like why pull instead of Well, we pull because uh, you, if you cut them, you can't get down. You want to pull it so it breaks clean down in the rosette, down the base of the flowers. Otherwise, it leaves a stem up high, and it's a, it's a place for rot to form. That's why we pull them instead of cutting them. 